the time. So good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, last session of this very stimulating workshop. And I certainly learned a lot that Arthur, uh, thank you very much for including me. Uh, I must say this is somewhat of surrealist, a surrealistic experience for me because Arthur taught me uh, classical mechanics in this room about 40 years ago. Uh, so a few reminders. Uh, the session, including the uh, uh, Q&A portion, is being recorded. Uh, to ask a question, you know, please raise your hand and wait until your hand at the microphone to make sure that everybody hears you. Uh, and finally, a reminder to the speakers, you have 35 minutes, uh, including discussion. So I will signal you uh, at the roughly 25 minute mark uh, to make sure that you leave enough time for, for questions. So the first talk this morning is on Emerging Frontiers in Computational Drug Discovery uh, by uh, Hari Atanari from the Harvard Medical School. Thank you, Alex. And I think I'm audible to everyone. I'd like to start by thanking Arthur and the team to, for this kind invitation to speak at this, uh, at this workshop. It's in fact a, a pleasure, an honor, and rather a daunting experience to talk in front of all of you. So in the world where I come from, N equals three is good enough to show that things are very good. That's what we do as a statistical replicates. So by that token, the Goldbach conjecture in our world is done and dusted. <laughs> but I'm not a mathematician by no stretch of imagination, I can be one. I'm not a card carrying physicist but rather an avid admirer and a consumer of mathematics and physics to answer some of the key biological problems. I'm a biophysicist who uses nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, where we orchestrate the spins in a biomolecule system to obtain relativistic distance information between atoms, and then use this to get a molecular picture of the biomolecules that dictate life. So I'm going to show you two of the major classes of biomolecules that are important to life. On your left-hand side, you will see a nucleic acid. This is an RNA. And on the right-hand side, you see a protein. So normally, these biomolecules are very small to be observed by a light microscopy. They're about anywhere from about 1,000 to 10, sorry, 100 to 1,000 times smaller than what can be seen with a powerful light microscope. The protein that you see on the right-hand side is the polymerase. That's the photocopier of your genetic material. And the cross-section across the protein is about 100 Armstrongs. So you can look at what the complexity of the architecture of these micromolecular machines are. At any time in our body, there are roughly about 20,000 of these working at different stages to make us function as a, 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 as a being. Now, this is a static picture that I'm showing you of these molecular machines. Just like if I would show you, or a person from Mars, a picture of this horse, a static picture, they would think that horse is a flying entity. Whereas, in principle, these molecules or these biomolecules are rapidly moving or dynamic in, in our cells, which is essential for its function. And using techniques, experiment techniques, including NMR, we can understand the dynamics of these biomolecules at different scale. And just to see them in action, I want to take a quintessential example of a biomolecule that is working. This is a protein called kinesin that is actually transporting cargo within your body. So you can see a protein walking along the microtubule, and it is transporting vesicles from one end of the cell to the other. There's another protein, dynein, which actually could go the other way. So this tells us how complex and how interesting these molecular machines are. But they become important in the cases where these machines are dysregulated in the context of diseases. So uh, a disease could happen when one or a particular pathway involving these machines are dysregulated. And knowing the architecture, the molecular architectures of these machines, we can find therapeutic opportunities to either activate them 
or to inactivate them. So the analogy I would like to give you is that, think about a, a door you would like to inactivate. If you know what the molecular architecture of the lock is, you could design a key that will go in there and it will not turn, essentially rendering the lock ineffective. That's the type of thing we would like to do in, in, in our lab. And now if you consider the therapeutic landscape, this could be broadly classified, not a complete set, but could be broadly classified into two arenas. One is vaccines and biologics on one side, and the other is the small molecule therapeutics. And the small molecule therapeutics often can be thought about the pill that you can pop uh, with a glass of water. Now, if you want to find a small molecule that would engage to a protein and inactivate the protein, the total space of the small molecules that could potentially act as drugs is posited to be 10 to the power of 60. That small number of atoms that uh, we possibly have are approaching the number of atoms we have in the galaxy. Yet today, a typical experimental method that searches for this needle in a haystack screens about 500,000 to a million small molecules experimentally. And one of the problems of seeding such a small sample of this vast possible space is that there is delay in getting therapeutics to patients with chronic disease and even um, uh, things like pandemic. Uh, it, there's a huge delay in getting these drugs to the patients. Now, the small molecule uh, that I'm going to focus on today, ARENA, Binding to a protein is largely dictated by thermodynamics. So we all know about, we have studied about the Gibbs free energy, which has contribution from both enthalpy and entropy. And we, there's different manifestations of it. But in my opinion, small molecule binding and pretty much life is, is uh, dictated by thermodynamics. Now, if you zoom in on the intricacies of how a small molecule binds to a protein, the entire process can be further deconvoluted into individual components. We can think about a small molecule that exists in water, approaches a protein, and then binds to the protein. There has to be some desolvation that happens when the small molecule binds to the protein. There's going to be enthalpic and favorable interactions of the small molecule that's kind of binding to the protein, which contributes to the enthalpy. So we can deconvolute each of the steps. And some of these steps can be calculated with higher accuracy computationally, and the other can be approximated. Now, in the realm of computational screening or virtual screening, just to set the stage, this is what we do. We take the three-dimensional structure, the architecture of the small molecule that we want to inactivate or activate, identify the Achilles heel in this molecule. For example, this could be the active site of the enzyme or the functional unit of that uh, protein or the, the interface of that protein that helps it to interact with the helper protein. Essentially, by targeting the site, we should be able to inactivate the protein. Then what we do is that we take a small molecule from the library of small molecules we have in our computer. Then we place a molecule into this Achilles heel of the protein. And then we sample different orientations. And then for each of the orientation, we calculate what is the possibility of the small molecule engaging that particular pocket in that orientation. And we assume that nature is going to find the best orientation for that particular molecule. And we document a score called the docking score for the best orientation for this particular molecule. Mm -hmm. Then we repeat this with the library of molecules that we have. And at the end of the day, the molecules at the top of the pile having the best energetics have the best possibility of engaging this pocket in, uh, in, in, in an experimental setup. Now, the process that I uh, described to you can be divided into two parts. One is the post-generation, as how do we search the space? And the other is evaluation for each one of these poses. How does the molecule, what are the energetics of the molecule engaging that particular pocket in the protein? Now, here is a protein, and what I show you in a grid is the box that I'm, we are interested in docking because that's the most important part of the protein, which is the, uh, the functional end of the protein. And then we can either go through an exhaustive search mechanism in a grid-based manner. We can use stochastic uh, algorithms, genetic algorithms, and if we are informed by things like AI and ML, we can do, use some informed methods to, uh, to search the space. 
this search space becomes a very important computational uh, limit. The more exhaustive that you do this, this search, the better your results are, but that comes at a, at, at a cost of the computational time that you have. Now, for each of these poses that you're searching, each of the, the traversal that you're doing and then the rotation of doing of the small molecule, you need to calculate how best the small molecule could engage the protein. For this, there are different religions, I would say, uh, in, uh, in how you can calculate it. We traditionally use classical physics-based approaches because it's faster. As you can see, the, the first term is probably uh, a, a textbook for most of the physicists. It has a Leonard Jones uh, term, one over 12, one over six. It has some cool mimic terms. That's one way of doing it. So we take different atoms of the small molecule in relationship to the protein and then calculate what are the energetics to see how this molecule could engage uh, the protein. There are other methods, there are empirical methods. So we can take rather than uh, atom per atom um, uh, calculation, we can say that there, this molecule has these important functional entities. This functional entity is going to form a hydrogen bond. We know what the energetics of that is. This is going to be involved in a hydrophobic interaction. We know what the energetics of that is. So we can take the functional entities and sum them up. We can go to the database of structures and then see known structures of small molecule engaging the protein and do some knowledge base uh, methods to see which part of this molecule could contribute to the free energy. And something that I'm not very familiar with uh, is machine learning techniques that can also be used to uh, um, evaluate and rank the uh, possibility of each of these molecules from your computational library to engage uh, uh, that particular space on the protein. Now, this whole process has some blind spots. One of the things that we can do in order to sample a large amount of molecule is to ignore protein dynamics. It's not that we cannot account for protein dynamics, but when you account for protein dynamics, the computational process becomes extremely time consuming. So what we do is that we simplify the system by ignoring protein dynamics. Desolvation is not explicitly taken into account it's rather implicitly taken into account, which is again a drawback because a number of water molecules play a very important role. If there is a water molecule at the binding site and is getting liberated, you're going to lose some enthalpy, but you're going to gain some entropy from the water molecule being liberated. So these are not explicitly taken care of. And as I show you here, uh, a, a molecule binding to a protein could cause structural changes on the protein, but the protein could adapt like a glue when the molecule binds to it. And these are very hard to capture in a rather uh, high throughput manner because you require molecular dynamic simulations after that. These are some of the blind spots in, in the molecular docking process. But what has been a new realization, and especially by the work uh, that Christopher and our group did, and also by the group of Shoykat and Irvin uh, out in the West Coast, is that some of these blind spots can be accounted for or mitigated by increasing the scale of the library that you search. So there were two Nature articles earlier in 2019 when we were working on this particular project, which led to a, a News and Views article saying the bigger is better in virtual screening. To, to give you an analogy, I'm, I'm a terrible soccer player, but if you'd give me about a thousand shots on goal, I'm about to bound to hit one. And that's the analogy that we have over here is that the largest the space that we screen, we might not get every possible inhibitor, but we might get a few potent inhibitors could be a very good starting point for us to do further chemistry. That's a goal over here. So what is the bottleneck in this particular problem? To do what's called a rigid body docking, where we hold the protein constant and try several combinations of molecules in different orientation, it takes us on average about 15 seconds to dock one particular molecule. Now, if you're approaching a very small number of this 10 to the power of 60 space, that's a billion molecule, that'll take us about 475 years. But we want to do this in a matter of days. This problem of docking a molecule to, to a protein is rather um, parallelizable, easier said than done, but to take a large system like a billion molecules to dock to the protein, one needs a platform that completely removes the uh, communications between these, these uh, individual processes. And this is what Christoph did as part of his PhD, where he developed this platform 
virtual flow, which does this with amazing linearity, which I'll show you in the next slide. So this uses the power of computing clusters and massively parallelized algorithms to accomplish this in a matter of days. So here is the scaling of uh, the virtual flow in different computational systems. The first two you can see is, was done at Harvard, where we went to about um, 30,000 uh, CPUs. And here you can see uh, the scaling that goes across uh, 160,000 CPUs in Google. And Christoph has recently scaled this to about uh, 3 million CPUs on AWS, and the process is fully linear. So this is one of the remarkable things of, of virtual flow. Now the platform has two independent wings. The first is called the ligand preparation module, and the second is called the virtual screening module. So what does the ligand preparation module does? So take any ligands that one can imagine. So the 10 to the power of 60 number that I, that I uh, told you about are not molecules that exist physically. They are molecule that exists in a computer space or somebody's imagination. So what we need to do is that we need to take those molecules that or a chemist can draw, which is shown you on the, on the left-hand side, give it proper three-dimensional entity, stereochemistry, bond orientation, and also decorate it with the correct charges and partial charges. So it's ready for us to dock. So currently, we provide the largest ready-to-dock library in the world, which is about 2.4 billion molecules in a ready-to-dock format. This is a one-time effort. So once a, a scientist or a researcher is able to do this and make it available to the public, this could be reused because there's no reason. The, uh, this doesn't change in the context of the protein. Now, the second part of the, of the platform is where the virtual screening comes in. So here we take a structure that could come from an X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM, NMR, and recently de novo structure prediction uh, platforms like AlphaFold. Then we identify using the trained eye of a biologist or a biochemist to see what part of the structure is very important. And then we take the molecules that were prepared by the ligand preparation module, and then we do the screening. The screening could be done in a stage-wise manner. So for example, if you're going to screen a billion molecules, you would use the fastest setting. And then you can reorder them by using, including more things like protein dynamics, but you do that to the top million molecules. All this arises because of the, the pragmaticity of, of the computational time that is available to us. Now, on an average, when you do these ultra-large screening, your true hit rate, which is the number of molecules that is experimentally, uh, that is theoretically predicted from computation, that are a hit in experimental methods, is anywhere from about 15 to about 40 percent. And for the reasons that I told you before, uh, there are certain blind spots that uh, the hit rate is not more than this. But we can increase the true hit rate by going to even more involved. Uh, calculations that uses uh, quantum mechanics. For example, we can't just use quantum mechanics for the entire system of protein. The protein is about uh, uh, tens of thousands of atoms, and if you put water molecule to it, you're looking at uh, atoms that are more than 100,000. You can't use quantum mechanical calculations for the entire protein. But what we can use is the quantum mechanical molecular mechanical calculations, where you take the important part of the protein that is supposed to interact with the small molecule, treat that with quantum mechanics, and of course the water molecules there with quantum mechanics, and you can teach the rest of the protein using molecular mechanics. Even this is very computationally expensive for doing for tens of thousands of molecules. We can do it for one of two molecules today. But hopefully somebody in this audience uh, uh, would have methods, including things in quantum computing, that could uh, fasten this for, for a large set of molecules and thereby increasing our two hit rate. So now you no longer need to order and test uh, 500 molecules. You can order 10 molecules and you can get a much higher accuracy. So here is the platform again, having two different modules, the ligand preparation module um, um, and the virtual screening module. And using this, for the first time, we screened about 1.3 billion molecules to activate a particular pathway in our body. It's called the NRF2 pathway. And uh, what this does is that this does help in cytoprotecting your cells. This pathway is very important in diseases like neurodegenerative diseases, uh, chronic kidney diseases, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. 
Here the protagonist is this uh, protein in red, it's called NRF2, which binds to this protein in green and it's constantly degraded or chopped off. Now upon activation by reactive oxygen species, which are the bad things that come and affect your cells, there's a small change that happens in the, in the green protein liberating or freeing up the red protein. The red protein goes inside the nucleus and starts a program that is cytoprotective to itself. And our idea is to do this ectopically, rather than waiting for reactive oxygen species, if we could find a molecule that will bind at the interface between the red and the green protein, the red protein will no longer bind to the green protein, thereby you have a cytoprotective program activated, and thereby you can cure something like a chronic kidney disease. So just to put this 1.3 billion molecule screen into context, these were some of the largest high throughput screens that were carried out before that. They generated about 150 million molecules, and this is from a, a, a recent uh, review, and we came in at about 1.3 billion. But keep in mind, this is just a little a tiny drop on the 10 to the power of 60. We're no longer uh, close to that. Now I'm going to show you some experimental validations. So where the molecules that we got computationally, how can we experimentally validate them? Here we use a technique called SPR or surface plasmon resonance, which measures the on and off rate of the molecule binding to the protein. We show that it binds with a very high affinity. We use nuclear magnetic resonance to show that the molecule binds to the protein. And here we use something called the fluorescent polarization assay that takes advantage of the molecular tumbling time of the NRF2 molecule binding to the big protein, uh, KEEP1. And in the presence of the small molecule, you can see that we see a decrease that the, that the NRF2 is displaced in a concentration dependent manner with increasing concentration of our small molecule. Now here we can use nuclear magnetic resonance. So this is what we call a heteronuclear single quantum coherence spectra. Rather, it is just a correlation of the atomic positions of atoms in your protein. And each of the dot in this two-dimensional spectra represent a particular atom in your protein, and they occur in different places in this uh, graph because of the unique electronic environment. Now, if you add a small molecule to this, the electronic environment at the binding interface is going to change. From there, we can map where the small molecule is binding to your protein. And using these shifts where you can see differences between the red and the blue, we can tell you exactly the molecule is binding at the same place where the NRF2 protein binds, thereby competitively displacing the protein. And we can go take this molecule into cells and shows the NRF2 pathway is activated. Here are the results of the activation. As you can see from one, it's activated about sixfold uh, for our uh, top inhibitors that we got from the screen, I keep one and I keep two. And this is compared uh, in, in uh, um, black to a drug that's actually in the market. It's called uh, Texedra and it's dimethyl fumarate. So you can see our molecules perform much better at much lower concentration comparing to a drug that's in the market. Now, when we published this paper, and just to put this into the context of the current times, uh, we enter into a, a pandemic. We were actually sitting at home uh, within the lockdown. So we decided what we can do. So we decided to target the proteins that are critical for the viability of the SARS-CoV-2 protein. So we targeted 17 different proteins. And in each of the protein, we targeted multiple functional sites. The analogy here is that if you want to stop a car, you pull the brake, you slash the tire, and cut the engine. And to look at this analogy, I'm going to show you the main engine of the SARS-CoV-2, which is a polymerase. As you know, the virus is the main purpose of the virus is to replicate itself. So this is the protein that actually makes a copy of the genetic material of the virus. And here's the structure of the protein. In gray is the main protein. And what you see as spirals is the RNA that binds to it, which needs to be replicated. Now, if you get a molecule that binds to this tunnel, then you prevent the RNA from binding, thereby the protein is inactivated. Now, this particular protein requires two helper proteins that I'm going to show one in pink over here and the other in olive. Now, if you could find a molecule that binds to that particular interface, now the pink protein no longer can bind, and hence you inactivate the protein. And here, if you find a molecule that binds to this interface, the green protein that cannot bind, and hence the polymerase is inactivated. So here's an example of how you target multiple functional sites, which is only computationally possible. 
experimentally, it's much harder to do these type of uh, uh, experiments. And it should be noted that the sites we targeted on this particular protein is conserved among all other coronaviruses. So what is shown in, in, in this particular plot is redis conservation among multiple viruses, classes of viruses, starting from SARS to MERS to the Hong Kong virus. And now, so essentially this tells us if we could find a cure, if we could find one of these molecules to be effective inside the cell, we could have a pan-corona um, um, uh, medication that might work for other pandemics that of this class that could come out. So in, in summary, we screened about 17 proteins that are critical for the SARS-CoV-2, 40 different target sites, a total of 50 billion docking instances. And this took about 100 million CPU hours in about a matter of four weeks in the Google Cloud. We put all this data to the public uh, so that they can start working on, on uh, cures while we also started experimental validation. And I'm gonna quickly finish with two examples of these experimental validation. One is the spike ACE2 interaction, and then other is the example that I showed you of the polymerase. Everybody knows about the spike protein uh, as a part of SARS-CoV-2, which engages with the human angiotensin receptor, and that's how the virus enters our cell. Now, our idea is that if you could find a molecule that will just bind at the spike protein interface and prevent the spike protein from engaging the SARS-CoV, the, our ACE2 receptor, then we have a drug. So I'm going to show you the results of experimental validation from one such molecule. We can show using bioluminance interfer interferometry that this molecule displaces the ACE2 from the spike. We can show by surface plasmon resonance that it actually binds to the spike protein. And here's a very critical experiment. So five more minutes. Yeah, I think I'll be done. So we cannot work with um, SARS-CoV-2 in our lab because it requires certain bio-level safety. But what we did was we took a very harmless virus, a lentivirus, and functionalized it with a spike protein. And now we asked this virus to carry a message. That message is green. So if the virus infects our cell, you'll see a green fluorescent protein in your cell. Now here I show you the cells with the control experiment where we can see the green fluorescence protein. Now with our molecule, you no longer see green in the cell. Essentially, the, virus, the spike protein is no longer able to engage the H2, but we just want to make sure that the cells are not dying. And you can see the nucleus level stained in blue here. So the cells are happily living, but it's no longer able to inject it. Then we were able to collaborate with um, Boston University's needle facility, where they have a BSL-4, a biosafety level four lab. And here we can show our compounds are extremely active in, in actually live viruses. They can show that in a concentration-dependent manner, we see a market reduction. And just going back to the polymerase, here you show an, a, a molecule that is able to displace the RNA from binding to that RNA binding tunnel. And here we show that it's able to kill the viruses. You can, the viruses here are in green. These are actual viruses. And then the molecule that was identified from the screen is able to inhibit that and, and, and kill the viruses. Similar to this is binding to the green protein. We have a molecule that binds to the NSP12, the gray protein, where the green protein would bind. And it no longer allows the green protein to bind and thereby inactivating the viruses. So here are some experimental examples of the drugs that are derived from our computational screen. So in short, we used to do things this way, much longer and screening, uh, accessing a much smaller space, the uh, chemical space. But using computational approaches, we can, ask, uh, we can now begin to approach much larger space. Why is this exciting today? If you asked me two years ago, would I, would I, or in 2018, can I screen two billion molecules? The answer would have been no, because there was not two billion molecules available and the computational time was not, uh, and virtual flow was not available. It's to a trifecta of three different technologies that have come up. One is ready access to high resolution structure, which are starting points for us. So we have the resolution revolution by cryo EM. We have things like alpha fold, getting you structures of pretty much any human proteins you want. We have larger libraries that are made available by the, uh, the chemist, and we have the pump computing power using the power to use millions of vCPUs along with things like AI and ML. Now, what we need to this to be better is to better uh, have better and faster search routines to exhaustively uh, search it. Now, all our method predicts, what I told you is predicts is the ability of a molecule to bind to a particular protein. It doesn't tell you what other protein it can bind to, which is where things like toxicity and off-target effects come. Now, before even taking the molecule to an animal model, can I predict bioavailability and clearance? 
Can we increase the accuracy of these docking gratings using QM and uh, MM methods at scale? I'm talking about millions of molecules. Um, increase the space search space. Can we go to 100 billion to a trillion molecules? And can we include conformational um, um, dynamics and adaptation? All these we know how to do, but we don't know how to do quickly. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the people uh, who did the work. Actually, uh, the main architect of this platform is Christoph, who's, who's over here and works with Arthur. The experimental validations were done with uh, Krishna and Patrick, and we thank the uh, Google Cloud team, and I thank you for your patience and, and uh, listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Harry, for a very exciting talk. Can I ask a question now? So uh, this is in Haiwan. So I'm a mathematician in case you don't know. So I have two questions actually. Uh, one is at the very beginning, you said, you know, in order to study this biomolecule dynamics, you have to deal with the different skills. So the different skill is just given by the size of the biomolecule or something more subtle? It's a very good question. So I'm going to use my finger here. Uh, let's say uh, a molecule is doing this, and that's happening in the nanosecond time scale. But every millisecond, it does this. Okay. And every, like, let's say, microsecond, it does something like that. So there are motions in the molecule at every time scale. So essentially, I think of this as a camera. So if you want to capture a, a horse running at the, at, the, at the finish line, you need a particular window, you need a particular uh, aperture size. If you want to capture something that a flower blooming, you need a different aperture size. So for that, there are different scales of motions that happen all the way from the microsecond to the, time, to the seconds time scale. Now, in order to capture each of this, there's not a single experiment that capture all of them. We need to adjust our lens, use a different lens to capture each one of these motions. I see. Uh, my second question, uh, by the way, it's an incredible uh, talk. So uh, my second is related to your future. So actually my wife is in drug discovery in her whole career. So how could you deal with the toxicity? Because you know, if you don't experiment, that's the most important thing to decide You know, if this is a good drug candidate or not. So how would you deal with that? It's one of the hardest uh, things to deal with. So the, the first thing we have to understand is that where does the toxicity come from? So one of the ways that we can rule out, not, the, not, not an exhaustive way, is does your, does your small molecule bind to other proteins that might, could be essential to the cell? So I, I know I'm looking for a small molecule that needs to bind to a driver of a particular disease. Does it now inactivate a key protein that every cell needs? So that's one way of looking at it. How long does a small molecule stay in your, in your system? It should be able to deactivate and it should be, so the clearances and other things. Some of these things are much harder to, uh, to, to a priori predict. But what is happening is that there is an effort by several pharmaceutical industry to dump or to give, make publicly accessible all the negative data, all the small molecules that have failed the toxicity studies. From this, can we get fingerprints? And this is where things like AI and ML could come into play, that we can say that, oh, this molecule has a fingerprint that will lead to toxicity. Is there a purely scientific way? I don't think that could do all the things, um, at least for the time being, in my opinion. Hey. Okay, yeah, uh, I'm Xiao Gang Wen, and uh, my question is that uh, after your computer search, how many small molecules you can find which have a similar merit? Uh, so what is the scale? What's a rough number? That's again a very good question. The larger the search you do, the top of the pile is going to have more small molecules that have the potential. So for example, I would just throw out a number, depending on the target, it, you might have the top million molecules that could be equally attractive. Let's say a top million. But then we don't have the time nor the resources to buy a million molecules. So what we do is that, then we go into things like, okay, can I filter this out for diversity? 
So for example, as long as I get one or two potent hits, then we can go in a different direction. Now, I don't want molecules that are similar. I want molecules that are very different to, 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 to search first. So we order about anywhere from about 500 to 1,000 small molecules to test from there. But which of the 500 we're going to order, we put it into mul multiple filters and multiple diversity things to see what diverse set we can get. And that is only limited by our um, financial and, and, and experimental time. There was another question. Okay, two more quick questions, I think we're... Uh, how do you deal with the question of promiscuity? So promiscuity is, again, is the... Um, uh, is the idea where a small molecule that you think is going to bind to your protein binds to other proteins, which you do not want to engage with. Now, with as I said, there are about 20,000 proteins in your body. Now, with thanks to Google's AlphaFold or DeepMind's AlphaFold, they don't like to be called Google, uh, DeepMind's AlphaFold, um, you have the structure of all the 20,000 proteins, at least most of them then what we can do is that you can do what's called an inverse virtual screening. So from the screen, I have a set of 500 molecules I'm interested in purchasing. Which of these molecules would bind to other proteins? So this problem is a much more simpler problem. It's no longer a one cross one, uh, one billion matrix. It's now like a, a hundred cross 20,000 matrix. And thereby you can, you can remove promiscuity. And there are certain proteins that we'd like to highlight things like the CYP enzymes. And, and uh, so there are ways of, of, of removing promiscuity. Toxicity is, 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 a, is, a, is a different question and, and bioavailability is so the molecule can it enter the cell and be available and cleared is a much different problem. Well, thank you. Uh, there's a heavy dependency on computational chemistry. Uh, would it be better to identify a better constraint in computational chemistry to parameterize selection for optimum success in pairing? Pairing of? of... Uh, your selection for uh, cure uh, drug with the disease. So let's say we start with the, with the I'm, I'm trying to properly understand the question. Let's say we start with the protein. And we're looking, and we know from biophysics and biology which part of the protein is very important for its function. And we're trying to find a molecule. So with that paradigm, could you rephrase your question, please? Uh, so it's identifying a better uh, computational constraint in a selection process. So you're extending libraries. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you narrow the field uh, to get more specific so it isn't entirely randomization? Yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll probably try to answer this question in a way that I understand it. If it's not complete, we can already, already discuss. Let's say, if I'm looking for a drug that's for a neurological that has to cross the bread brain barrier, right? So then what we do is that we take this entire 2 billion molecules that we have, and we narrow down the molecules to a certain molecular weight because we know that larger molecules cannot cross the bread brain barrier. So then we say that I know what this is the disease that I'm looking for. And for this molecule to work, it needs to cross the blood brain barrier. So I pre-select from this library to a set of subset of molecules that have the opportunity or have the possibility to cross the blood brain barrier. I guess my, my question is beginning to probe uh, the very generalization of the expression nature. And um, it's, I, I heard you mention, you know, um, how to do things quickly, uh, if you can just find. Um, so these uh, general terms, um, it seems to have some root uh, connection in ordered uh, symmetry in nature itself, um, that uh, nature has order uh, beyond uh, the molecular uh, interactions. You know, why do they do what they do? What, what instructions are they given to actually do that? For that, we have a lot of knowledge of the molecular architecture of similar machines doing similar works. So for example, there's a class of protein called kinases that tag other proteins for activity. So the architecture of similar kinases look alike. But what we are trying to exploit there is the differences among similar architecture so we can selectively target one and not the other. Wouldn't that reveal a, a, a deeper or? Yes. 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 That would reveal the, the molecular structure and the molecular, uh, the active sites would, would definitely encode a deeper set of information. Yeah, I'm sorry I, to uh, interrupt this interesting conversation. I think there are many more questions. Let's thank Harry for a, a wonderful talk and a very impressive set of results.